today, well, there's a lot of data about, but what is it really telling us? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to his post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And today I'm joined by journalist Tarek Brooker. Hi Tarek. Hello Martin, how are you? I'm pretty good, how are you going? Yeah, not too bad, just trying to make sense of it all. <laughs> have, you, have you found the answer? Because uh, I've been wading <laughs> through the statement on monetary policy. I listened to Phil Lowe this morning in front of uh, uh, the uh, um, House Committee. And of course I listened to his speech during the week. And I've been looking at all the data and I'm thinking, you know, there's the old phrase about from the old world of banking that words and figures differ. Um, I think <laughs> words and figures differ. What I'm seeing in the real economy and what everybody is talking about from all of this material is just so different. It is. And I think, you know, the, the answer is there are no easy answers. You know, there, there's all of these, you know, sort of nice little narratives that we've put together that we all like to, well, not all, but a lot of people like to believe. And we've drawn all these nice little trend lines off off these, you know, off the current run of data, but it just, it, it's, it's hard to see. I mean, like Michael Pasco had a good piece out in the New Daily today talking about how, you know, the, the withdrawal of fiscal stimulus is going to impact the economy significantly. Mm. And this is something that we've been talking about on, on, on the channel here for, well, I don't even know, a long, a long time. <laughs> But since, you know, since February, at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Since last year. And, you know, it, it's all about, you know, the contractionary fiscal impulse and all the all these sort of, you know, concepts. And it's rather clear that, that it is going to have that effect. You know, it's just a question of what to what degree. So, you know, that that's really what we need to figure out going forward if we're going to know, you know, where the economy is going. Yeah, and I just come back to the difference between what I call the real economy and, uh, you know, what the simulated economy look, looks like. I mean, I was looking at some data today from my surveys, and there's been quite a spike in part-time uh, insecure work in the last few weeks, right? Quite a lot. Uh, but what it means, actually, is that more and more people are in work situations where they're now earning less than they were previously. And so that is having a significant impact on many households. I'm also seeing, uh, and other people's data shows it too, that um, you know there are a lot of people exposed to further drops in the job keeper, job seeker by the end of March. That's going to leave a hole as well. Uh, so I sort of scratch my head. And in fact, Phil Lowe even did admit that he would expect to see the unemployment rate rise a little um, after March when some of those things change. Um, and yet they are still so bullish about uh, the overall situation. So I just uh, I find it quite difficult to sort of put, you know, understand how the two can fit together. I'm not really sure about the whole bullishness of the situation. Like Phil, Phil Lowe seemed a little bit, a bit, bit of a bet both ways in some ways. You know, he's like, well, we're not really sure how this is going to work out. And I wanted to say we don't have any experience in dealing with these types of conditions. Mm. And I think he's done quite a nice job there covering himself because we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the, the, the only example we have of this level of withdrawal of fiscal stimulus is after the war. It's never happened before and it's never happened since. Mm. So... We, we really are in uncharted waters. And I think I think that's one of the key things that isn't really being acknowledged. You know, it's all just sort of, oh, okay, everything's going to be back off to the races. We've got, you know, all this stimulus. We've got all this bent up savings. Everything's going to be fine. But, you know, let's just imagine for a moment that, that we go back to 2019 levels of growth, that, that the underlying fundamentals of the economy as they sit today are roughly similar to those in 2019. So you have to take out things like, large amounts of net immigration, you've got to take out things like students, you've got to take out things like tourism exports, and then you've got to add in the, the fact that Australians are spending more at home here in Australia. You put all that together, it's not a pretty picture. In 2019, total total growth for the year was 1.9%. You take out the 0.85% that comes from immigration, and it looks pretty ordinary. Yeah, it does indeed. And, uh, you know, they run these three scenarios, right? You know, so it, it, let's assume the vaccine gets rolled out and things begin to open. They're talking about maybe borders opening before the end of the year. Then they say, well, there's a slightly more aggressive one that uh, if things go a little better and then there's a slightly worse one, things might go worse. But even then, if you look out three years, their inflation target is still 
below the two to three percent, which is what this is all about in the first place. Uh, so I'm just thinking with you that uh, you know, a lot of it's a bit uh, it's just sort of in fairyland, really. It is, and there's this idea that he's not going to raise rates before 2024. Hmm. Now, while I, I actually share that view with him, and I think that rates are going to stay lower for longer, yep. a lot of people don't share that view. And we are going to be at the mercy of, of you know, the, the tides of the global bond market. Mm. And if we do see a significant uptick in inflation, whether it's driven by, you know, whether it's driven by a transitory issue, like something like supply chain problems, or whether it's driven by, you know, shipping costs, as we're seeing, you know, the cost of shipping from China to the rest of the world rising something like 500, 600% in recent months, you know, you, there's a whole bunch of different things that could cause a, a transitory burst of quite well, we won't call it high because we, you know, we, we're, our inflation's so low, but of, of increased inflation that is going to put pressure on global bonds. We're already seeing this, you know, the U, the Australian ten year nearly hit one point two five percent yesterday, you know, which is you know pretty much where it was in sort of mid twenty nineteen. So, like the whole emergency bond rates thing has gone out the window on the long end of the curve. So. You know, there is a there is a world where the RBA potentially loses control of pricing rates. I mean, yes, that's unlikely, but there are going to be pressures on them if we do see a sort of protracted period of transitory inflation. Mm. Well, I agree. And actually, I think the secret is the bond rate, right? So um, if you look at the 10 year in the US, it's also gone up again as well. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, concerning uh, forward-looking indicators that suggest that well maybe things aren't playing out and you know sure the Fed will do some more quantitative easing and of course there are people writing about QE2 and QE3 and QE4 now um, you know so you don't know how long this is going to go on for but the interesting of course observation is that uh, Frydenberg was previously saying well once uh, unemployment comes below a certain level then we've got to dial back some of that uh, public spending and start to to reset the budget again so that's another factor in the mix isn't it well the thing is that they're already starting to dial back the spending as it is you know we can we you know we, we, we can talk about you know what what's what's inherent spending what's what's required what isn't and that's obviously going to be a matter of debate that people are going to be talking about 15 years probably talking about 15 years from now mm. but the reality is is that you, we are now going to have a contractionary fiscal impulse you're going to have less mo government money being injected into the economy and that's going to be the reality now I mean, Scott Morrison did a speech at the National Press Club earlier this week in which he said that you can't continue to run Australia on taxpayer money. And while I wholeheartedly agree with him, and he's right, the removal of this of this stimulus funds, while like, to be honestly, I support it because I think it's most most of the stuff they're spending it on is a waste of money anyway, and I'd rather direct it at you know, more productive endeavours that are going to grow the economy, it is going to have an impact in the short term. And while, I mean, I know there's this idea that some people have that, you know, JobKeeper finishes, everything falls over. Mm. I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to take longer. We're going to see JobKeeper is going to end. The last payments are going to go out in April. So businesses are still going to have April. It'll be sort of May, June before you start to see, you know, the beginning signs. And then it'll probably be sort of Q3 before you start seeing the major impact once households and businesses have run down their savings. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've said uh, for some little time that I think September is going to be that critical quarter, right? Because by then some of the SME um, issues will come to the fore. We also know that there are some businesses already beginning to get into some quite significant difficulty. The job keeper never hit them. You know, it tended to go to the larger firms. So a lot of small businesses potentially could become insolvent later in the year. And uh, the other point is that um, household cash flow doesn't necessarily dry up you know, one afternoon, it takes a little bit of a while for this to work through. So um, it's going to be, I think, a few months. I also make the point that the latest retail figures which came out today showed a bit of a decline in December relative to November. And uh, I wonder whether we're going to see more of that ahead too, because I just wonder whether, in fact, people's um, uh, willingness to spend may also be tempered uh, with some of those changes going forward. Well, the retail economy is going to be the really fascinating one because that's proven to be arguably the key driver of the economy throughout the pandemic with the, you know, arguably with like the exception of probably mining. But the, the, the problem with the retail economy is that you only need 
an, a certain number of televisions. You only need a certain number of home, pieces of home office furniture. And we've all gone out and we've all bought all these things that we need because we've been sitting at home, you know, mostly, mostly, you know, not going out, not unless, you know, you're, you're lucky enough to be in sort of WA or Queensland. You know, a lot of us have been sitting at home, you know, twiddling our thumbs, so to speak, and looking around and going, I'd, I'd like to replace that, that, that and that. And we've all gone off to JB Hi-Fi or Harvey Norman and we've all spent bit on Nick Scarly and we've all spent spent up big. So we've exhausted that 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 pent up demand that, that that was there. You know, so that's all all been brought forward. And we're gonna pay for that in the coming in the coming months, you know, as we as we shift, especially as we shift back towards a goods and services economy, not so much a goods driven one. Well, that's true. And uh, of course a lot of that uh, stuff that was bought was on things like buy now, pay later, right? Um, which has been rising like you wouldn't believe. I'm just astonished at the data that I'm seeing from my surveys. More and more households just, just are using that compared with credit cards or other forms of, of, of pseudo credit. Interestingly, there was a report that came out uh, from the UK over the last few days from the regulator there. They've now basically ruled that buy now, pay later is a form of credit. And so they're now talking about credit regulation being required for that sector. Now, if that were to play out here as well, that could be a quite an interesting uh, shake up in that sector of the market. Uh, but what I'm fascinated about is that um, around 20% of people who have buy now, pay later end up paying late fees on it. So, you know, it's a very costly way of funding all those goodies that you just bought. It, it is. I mean, personally, I'm not, I'm not really a fan. That's just, but that's just me. But it's it, one thing I think is really interesting about the whole buy now, pay later thing is how how quickly it's sort of become this, you know, key foundational support for the ASX. You know, like our Afterpay is getting up towards being worth some of, as much as some of the big banks. I mean, yeah, I looked at the other day; it, it was up there, it was pushing up towards some of the some of the major European banks in terms of market cap, yep. and that's that's nuts. I mean, and, and and it's for a company that doesn't really make any money. But you know, I mean, you know, I I, I didn't buy Afterpay, so what do I know? <laughs> yeah. Well, the other point of it, of course, is that uh, the retailers actually pay for the privilege of using the Afterpay service too. Now that additional cost then gets spread back over the cost of retail for everybody. So there is actually an implicit cost also that people don't recognise through this mechanism. Well, that's that 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 would be interesting to think about. In just from you know, there's this idea that you know, buy now, pay later is going to take over the world. And okay, well, let's let's just imagine that it fractionally does so. <laughs> is that not going to be inflationary? At least at least in a, over, over a temporary period, that that these that these companies are going to have to jack up their prices if we do start to see a weakening of consumer demand in order to pay these fees. Well, it certainly could be. I mean, obviously, the fees related to the volume of transactions that are actually put through. So, I guess there is some direct correlation. But nevertheless, uh, the overall economics of these businesses, are, I think, are very poorly understood. And uh, of course, the local regulator here has said, no, 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 these aren't uh, these aren't credit facilities at all. It's a completely different uh, ball game. But I just wonder whether that uh, UK ruling could cha mark the change of the game here. We'll see, I guess, uh, get a guess ahead. But uh, the other point about retail is just the number of vacant shops. Now, I live close to Wollongong and I do go down to Wollongong sometimes. I have never seen so many vacant premises down the main drag in Wollongong. And as I look around other places too, I see it not universally so, but in quite a few different places. Um, and I wonder whether this is perhaps the best proxy of all for really understanding what's going on in terms of the overall economic footprint that we have. Um, it's not necessarily good news in many places, I think. No, and, and that just goes to show in a way how, how misleading some of the data can be. Because say, for example, prior to the pandemic, someone owned, owned a shop. Hmm. You know, they employed people, they had a business. That person now works part time driving for Uber, or they work part time in a shop. Now, okay, in in theory, a job is a job, but in terms of looking at things from the overall economy, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, it's not. They're com you know it's it, they're very very different in terms of the inputs. And just because more people are going out and spending more money at Harvey Norman or JB Hi-Fi, it doesn't mean that the retail economy outside of those major stores is actually performing well. Some of these retail stores are still struggling really, really badly. And that's why you're still seeing them continue to shut down. And 
and that's that's really just like a dollar isn't a dollar you know spent in retail just because it you know it's spent and it's and it, and it feeds into the national accounts it doesn't mean it's supporting the number of jobs that it would be in a say like a small shop that employs say two or three people in a low in a low turnover you know sort of you know in a low turnover sort of shop versus say someone who works in say JB Hi-Fi who sells tens of thousands of goods a year maybe hundreds of thousands of goods a year who then you know, who, who then counts towards the national accounts, but by the same token, it's not supporting anywhere near as much employment. Well, that's that's absolutely right. And uh, it's very interesting. I was talking to somebody in retail locally here the other day who have has just reduced the footprint of their shop by 50%. That's because they couldn't afford the rent, right? And they couldn't afford the rates because the turnover was way down. And now they basically run it themselves. They had two part-time workers who they now long, no longer use, and uh, they have to work a lot harder for about fifty percent less turnover and fifty percent less revenue to try and keep the ship afloat. Uh, and I asked them honestly, what was the likelihood of them being around in a year's time? And they said, almost none. So you know, y- you understand on the ground there are a lot of stories. I think of people really struggling. Another example. Um, completely different sector in the farming sector of course a lot of um, fruit pickers didn't arrive right so there were about what 25,000 um, under sort of need uh, across the fruit picking areas of the country at the moment which means a lot of the fruit isn't going to get picked which means a lot of the farmers um, they would have paid to you know put the crops in the ground and, and, and bring them to this point won't be able to bring them to market so that's another example of um, the fallout that probably isn't being fully taken account of. Another example, again, is tourism. Of course, now there's uh, big grizzles from the tourist sector for more government help and big grizzles from the university sector for more government help as well. So uh, this ain't over yet. No, it, it's not. And I think, is it, the, the question I've, I've begun to ask myself is, is it realistic? <laughs> exactly, you know, how, how much should we dedicate to this tourist tourism sector? Hmm. How much should we de- dedicate to the education sector? Because are we actually ever not ever but are we going to in the in the near future see things return to normal or are we just throwing good money after bad trying to save jobs that are going to disappear anyway and i think that's a conversation that we need to have now i know it's a politically unpopular conversation to have and it's much much easier to just go oh no it's fine i'm just going to ignore it pretend it's not happening like they did with the unis over the last sort of you know what is it now 10 months Mm. but it's a conversation that we nonetheless need to have i think Well, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, the old argument is, well, the thing we need to go back to where we were before this all happened, right, is a bit of a weird argument. What we should be perhaps arguing is, well, where is the opportunity to sort of do things differently ahead and uh, use it as an an innovation path rather than just, uh, you know, back to the future path. But no, no, that's uh, beyond uh, beyond the uh, ability of the country perhaps to do it, other than maybe at the margins. I mean, I just speak to so many innovators and, uh, you know, people with great ideas and people with new businesses who say, I can't get help, I can't find a way to, to take this business uh, into the next level because I can't get the support that I need. And then they look around and see the billions of dollars that went to large organisations through the JobKeeper programme. Um, and uh, a few of them paid it back, but almost none of them have. Um, the money went to the wrong places. Exactly. I mean, you know, CBA concluded in what was it Q two that the, the, the for the Q two figures that the JobKeeper provided something like fourteen billion dollars in extra additional corporate profits. Now, I, uh, considering the fact that outside of Victoria, retail recovered even more strongly in Q three, I imagine it's probably a pretty similar number, perhaps a bit bigger, perhaps a bit smaller. But either way, you're still looking at somewhere around about twenty eight, thirty billion dollars that was essentially pissed up against the wall. That was, you know, basically, you know, we got nothing to show for it. A lot of it went in, you know, executive bonuses, shareholder dividends, a lot of which flowed offshore, you know, which is really great for the Canadian pension fund that owns the that owns, you know, a, a sizable share of the company. But it doesn't do anything for for Australia. None of almost none of what we've seen from the government is going to drive the kind of pr- productive enterprise and job creation that we need to see. It's like, oh, great, we'll create, we created some more jobs at JB Hi-Fi. Fantastic. But it's like, but, that, but that's all you're creating. You know, you, you uh, for a lot of these businesses, they are still very, very cautious about hiring people. And that's why we've seen this big uptick in, in the hiring of, of, of part-timers and of casuals. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that job mix is, I think, very concerning. And uh, again, I've spoken to other people who were looking at the uh, new uh, schemes to uh, allow them to employ younger people and they realised that actually the costs were still quite significant and prohibitive, in fact. So they have not ru- they've not run away with that. But I guess there's a big silence from the other side of politics and all this. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, the Labour Party did a quick reshuffle the other day. I'd be interested to get your take on that. But um, I don't see much in the way of um, zigging or zagging the other way compared with, uh, you know, ScoMo's mob uh, from the other side of politics. Well, it's it's because Labor are basically stuck in a really difficult position because they're wedged. Because when all this started, they proposed the job seeker supplement. Yep. They proposed job keeper, and basically the government said, "Oh, yeah, right, yeah, they'll do. We'll do that." And you know, the I forget who I forget what Liberal minister it was, but you know, he said that him and Sally McManus from the ACTU were now bestest buddies for life. So that really sort of gave you an idea of how far the Liberal Party shifted from its traditional fiscally conservative roots to this sort of strange hybrid of sort of social conservatism and let's throw shed loads of money at the economy. So Labor are really in a really tough spot there. So, I mean, if Albo is going to win this without sort of, you know, employing this big, big scale, you know, transformative policy, policy suite, Basically, he just has to sort of win the game of personalities with Morrison because, I mean, but let's be honest, people people like the idea of a fiscally conservative government. They like the idea of surpluses. They like the idea of tax cuts and fiscal responsibility and people like all that stuff. And, that you know, that's been the case since, since Howard. But by the same token, while the Prime Minister is popular, I think that's largely driven by throwing money at people. And I think that he's not really the kind of person that people really want to have a beer with. And I think that's how a lot of Australian elections are decided. You just go, okay, well, who do I really want to have a beer with? Would I rather have a beer with Kevin Rudd or John Howard? And in that instance, Kevin Rudd won. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, of course, Howard's uh, time was typified by throwing a lot of money around because, of course, the tax receipts were uh, pretty remarkable. The mining sector was booming at the time. Uh, I've always believed that that was another example of throwing money in the wrong direction. Bought them votes in the in the short term, but ultimately didn't uh, buy them success uh, in the longer term. And as you say, Rudd, Rudd got in. Uh, but I just don't see a, a valid alternative narrative coming out of, of, of the labour sector at all at the moment. It just seems to me to be going nowhere. Well, they sort of learned in 2019 that a valid alternative narrative is can be can be quite politically challenging in some ways. <laughs> you so, know. so it's a small target, right? So we, it is. We don't stand for anything, but uh, we we won't uh, upset the apple cart too much and hope that somehow that magically gives us the vote. Pretty well, pr- pretty much. That's that's pretty much seems to be the the strategy that they're that they're employing. But to be in in fairness, that is the strategy that has worked. You know, Ke- Kevin Rudd was I'm John Howard, but I'm going to get rid of work choices and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. It wasn't really this sort of transformative agenda that Shorten took to the last election. Mm. And I, I, I don't really know what happened with Labor then, to be completely honest with you. I think that they just that they, they got too ambitious too quickly and it got to a point where it was like, well, how much is the climate change policy going to cost? Oh, we don't know. We don't know. Okay, cool. Why are you why are you you changing all of these policies like capital gains tax and franking credits for everyone and not just targeting the wealthy? Well, because it raises more revenue. But it's like, well, you could have got the vast majority of the revenue and just just done on it on the wealthy and quarantined. You know, say, okay, you can have fifteen grand a year in franking credits, and that's more than enough for basically anyone. Let's be honest. But you know, they they just decided these blanket policies were the way to go. <laughs> Well, it is very interesting, and I, I follow UK politics as well, and there's a somewhat similar thing going on there because, of course, um, you know, Boris has, uh, you could say at one level, stuffed up on a number of critical policies around uh, uh, the vaccine, and yet um, the other side of politics there seem to be going down the same path, and uh, it's not clear what they stand for, and it's not clear where they're headed either. So they've got this, uh, I think, small target um, issue as well. And maybe it's this, maybe if you are being relatively successful in terms of taming the virus, uh, then it's very hard for the opposition party to make any ground at all, because of course, that is at the moment the thing that's in the centre of gravity for most people. 
It is. It is. And that's that's something that's going to be really challenging for Labor going forward if ScoMo chooses to go to an election this year. Like, I, I can't see him waiting till next year, mostly because he, at that point you're at the you're putting yourself at the mercy of the of the global economic fates, and I don't think that's something that you'd want to do if you can avoid it. But it is it is going to be tough for for, for Labor to turn it around. I mean, although by the same token, News Poll's fifty fifty right now. You know, we're all talking about ScoMo like he's like he's a shoe in to win. You know, that that's basically the broad consensus across the political spectrum, you know, from, you know, from The Guardian to Sky News. That is the broad consensus. Yet it's 50-50. Things are closer than you'd think. And, and you, then you, you have to ask yourself, well, if, if news polls correct, and obviously there's been some fairly significant issues with polling in recent years, whether it's in the, U, you know, the US or whether it's here in Australia, what does that mean for, for, for Morrison? That he's thrown three hundred billion dollars at the economy, and the best he's got, uh, and the best he's got in, in this in this very moment is fifty fifty. I mean, does does that mean that when when all this starts to fade, Albo might actually start to look attractive? Because <laughs> I'll be honest, I, I don't I don't know. No, I'm not sure. I do too. But it'll certainly be an interesting uh, uh, things to watch ahead. But I, I'm pretty convinced that there will be an election later in the year, and I wouldn't be surprised to see some custom additional funding coming out between now and then. <laughs> You know, targeting tourism, targeting perhaps some farming education, etc., etc. I can almost see the um, see the argument that says, well, you know, we don't need to provide broad based support now because most of the economy is fine. There are a few small areas that, of course, have more significant issues. So we'll give them uh, some further support at the moment, and then effectively go to the election on that basis, and uh, probably comes back with um, you know, a thumping majority. That 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 is that is the theory, and that that may be the reality. It's it's, it's going to it's going to certainly be interesting to watch. It, it it's going to be really interesting to see what they do with the budget in May, because you know we're going to we'll start see the, seeing the leaks coming coming out in, the, in a few months, and not only that, but with a sort of protracted election campaign, it's not really that long after the budget that they would call a dissolution of parliament, and then you know it's the it's the usual dog and pony show of the election campaign for sort of four to six weeks. <laughs> so it's it's really going to be interesting to see what they do. Like, I'm curious, are they going to sort of throw the kitchen sink at the budget and then run on that in the election? Or are they going to be sort of quite conservative with the budget and then and then promise big for the election campaign? Yeah, we well, be interesting to see how that plays out. And I guess the other question, which is got to come back to, you know, Biden's there now in, in the US and he's already signaling quite significant changes of policy, including, of course, uh, climate change and uh, and other things and, you know, the US is back and will take a firmer view to the rest of the world. Um, and I wonder how that's going to feed into the conversation r- around the election here as well. It's going to be interesting because that there is sort of this perception that that Morrison isn't really in with Biden, that, 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 that Biden, you know, potentially, you know, doesn't really sort of hold him in high regard considering that, you know, ScoMo was one of the last, you know, sort of major world leaders and US allies that finally got a phone call from Biden two weeks after he, he took office. Now whether whether or not that's true or you know or not, I'm I, I don't know. I don't I don't have the I don't have the sources or the the intel to comment on that. But it is going to be interesting to see how how they interact because it's it's really fascinating in some ways. Because on one hand you know, Biden talks a huge game on climate change, you know, and all this sort of transformative progressive left-wing policy. And that's great, you know, sure. But by the same token, it's like, oh, hey, let's get back to fracking. You know, so it's this really sort of, I don't know, it's just this, this diametrically opposed policy that somehow exists in concert within, within the US administration. But then by the same token, you know, like you look at here in Australia, on one hand, you've got sort of the private sector you know, the sort of the lion's share of the private sector and households who are all, you know, say adopting solar power. You know, solar power is becoming an absolutely huge contributor to, to overall power generation here in Australia, at least obviously during the day. But the, the thing is, then you've got ScoMo who's just like coal and gas. So you've got these two different viewpoints, but in a lot of ways, they're actually remarkably similar. It's just the fact that Biden has much, much better PR than, than, than Morrison does. That's an interesting way to, to, to put it, because what you're saying is it's mostly spin anyway. 
Well, it is. It is spin. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the U.S. is still exporting coal. Yep. You know, that just same, same as us. You know, you go to the you go to the hills of Kentucky. They're still chopping the tops off mountains and digging out coal and s- selling it overseas to the to the Japanese, to the Chinese. I mean, you know, the Americans have been one of the biggest benefactors of our little trade spat with the yep. Chinese. So, you know, it's it's their coal there and the Canadians' coal. Who are, who, are, who are now fueling these Chinese power stations, despite the fact that, you know, Trudeau and and Biden get together and shake hands and sing Kumbaya around climate change. You know, it's, it, it, it is it is a lot a lot of spin. I would really like to see, I mean, yes, America is coming back to the Paris Agreement. They've, that, I believe, will be, I think there was a some form of administrative delay with them rejoining that, but Biden has signed the, the order to do so. But by the same token, you know, it's, it's America. All you need to do is just walk around and you go, oh, my God, that car is the size of a tank. You know, it must it must use, you know, more more fuel in a, in a in, you know, in a, in a week than my car does in a month. But, you know, that's that's what has that's what he has to overcome. You know, that, you know, there are America is an oil fueled oil now oil exporting nation, which is what they've been for most of their most of their industrialized history. Mm. And I just don't really see that there's all that much difference, just in except in the fact that ScoMo is is sort of what's a word to be kind that he just places and he he places too much public support behind the the uh, the energy sector, and not only that, but okay, maybe there is a difference. I will I will concede the difference on this on the sense that that Biden is smart enough to say. Yes, we're going to do all this stuff. Yes, we're going to do, you know, we're going to address climate change. We're going to build renewables, et cetera, et cetera. But you've got ScoMo who's like, let's do more stuff with gas. Mm. We're going to have a gas-fired recovery. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, of course, um, gas creates uh, more um, emissions than many other types of uh, renewables. Uh, So, you know, it's still not necessarily a very good good solution, is it? Um, and look, one other thing to explore before we finish today, um, you know, there, there were a number of um, uh, people on the back bench who were spruiking all sorts of weird uh, rumours with regard to the virus and uh, what you should and what you shouldn't do. Uh, and ScoMo finally sort of uh, slapped them around the face a bit. Um, what's your reading on that? <sighs> it's 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 a t- it's a tough one to get to get a read on to be honest it, because i I'm, i don't i don't know exactly what what goes on behind the scenes in in that sort of thing i don't i don't think very many people do and if they do they're keeping it to themselves because craig kelly got rescued by scomo before the last election he was he was going to be someone else was going to was going to be pre-selected to run for hughes and he he was going to be gone and that was going to be it but somehow craig kelly made this massive comeback and he you know here he is in the in the news headlines again, instead of a, a sort of footnote in the Liberal Party history book. And I'm not really sure exactly how he's managed to do that. You know, I mean, clearly he has some very powerful friends, or he's got you know sort of a nice collection of photos of some skeletons in some closets. But you know, I I don't really get it. And the fact is that he's still doing it. He's still going on on social media, and he's still you know posting all these things that he that Scomo said he's not supposed to. But I don't know. I'm I'm really curious to see what happens in the next in the next few months because I have a feeling that you're going to see some interesting moves from the Nationals again because the M- Michael McCormack is still sort of not really entirely secure in his position as as leader of the Nationals and deputy prime minister. So I'm just really curious to see exactly how that's going to play out because usually as you head towards an election, the Nationals turn around and they want something. You know, that's the way it works. You know, it's a transactional relationship. They're going to want something for their ongoing support. And, you know, and not only that, but if, if someone in the Nationals can turn around and try and cut a better deal and get rid of Michael McCormack, things could get really interesting. I mean, you never, you know, there's always Barnaby and Matt Canavan, you know, lurking in the background. And, of course, Barnaby signalled the other day that uh, maybe the Nationals should sort of step back a bit from uh, from the alliance, right, which is quite interesting in its own right. It, it is, and I and I think that's probably more of a negotiating tactic than anything. Because I mean, who doesn't? Who who would? Who would, what backbencher wouldn't love a ministerial salary? Let's just put it that way. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. You know, or or you know, a deputy whip or something like that. All these all these things add, add you know some nice little perks to the old salary. But it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting because I think the nationals really do have to, they really do have to differentiate themselves at some point. I don't think that's necessarily now. 
but I think that, that there is a there is sort of a time coming where where they're going to be forced to really differentiate themselves from the Liberals and make and make it clear that they are for the Bush. They're not just for being in government. Mm. Well, I think it'll be interesting. There's a lot to play out, isn't there? The, the next uh, few months are going to be really, really interesting. I'll be interested to see how the, uh, you know, the vaccine rollout goes and whether it really does uh, uh, go as fast and as effectively as some people want, or whether it's going to be tripped over. Whether we get uh, more international financial, up, um, you know, uh, distress because of the markets, or whether they settle down. And uh, you know, wherever you look, I think it's going to be an interesting and bumpy ride. So uh, we'll have to keep a track on it over the next uh, few weeks and months. Tarek and uh, see where it all ends up. Yeah, we so we certainly do, mate. These next, I think these next probably three or four months are going to be the decider potentially for the next couple of years, depending on if we get anything with any sort of finality to it. Finality? No, I've forgotten what that's like. <laughs> um, <laughs> it rather feels to me as though we're we're in the middle of a very very long heavy novel right you know it's like war and peace right but i reckon we're only in sort of the first third of the of of, of the novel <laughs> i reckon there's a long way to go towards we, before we get to the end <laughs> yeah i think it's i think it probably feels a little bit more like the hotel california than anything <laughs> that's probably right tarry go enjoyed with that thank you very much for your time once again and uh, we'll do it again soon no worries martin i'll catch you later mate see ya bye-bye bye